by now you can see that expectations hypothesis, as good as it is, uh, doesn't seem to square with what we actually observe about the term structure rate. In other words, we often see in that Financial Times plot, as well as the plot of uh, the relation between the slope of the yield uh, curve and recessions, we see that usually the yield curve slope is positive. Whereas, remember, expectations of the hypothesis predicts that the yield curve would be flat. So why is that? Well, we made a big assumption in creating the expectations hypothesis, which is the assumption of risk neutrality. We, remember, said that investors are risk neutral. Um, all they care about is maximizing holding period return. They don't care about the risk. But in truth, of course, uh, most investors are actually risk averse. They would rather have more certainty than less. Or given two different expectations, uh, they potentially even take a lower one, provided it was less uncertain uh, than a higher one, but with greater uncertainty. So if we actually allow for investors to be risk averse, and therefore caring not only about the expected holding period return, but about its volatility, uh, then what we should expect is a demand by investors for compensation for investing in long-term bonds. Why? Well, for two reasons. First of all, they're tying up their money for a longer period of time and therefore potentially incurring more uncertain outcomes. Remember in the financial assets lecture, uh, we talked about how longer maturity bonds in the capital market are somewhat more risky than the shorter term bonds in the money market. But also, they do face more price risk uh, because they may need to sell before maturity and therefore the holding period return that they might realize as interest rates do fluctuate uh, may be different. And conversely, if we think about instead the firm's perspective, the issuer, well, the firm might actually be willing to pay a higher rate to borrow for a longer period of time because they would like to avoid increases in a borrowing rate for the same reason that a investor may prefer to avoid fluctuations in uh, their investment rate because, well, certainty is valuable. It allows for better capital budgeting in advance and you don't want to face additional uncertainty about at what rate you might need to secure financing a year from now if you're rolling short-term bonds. So you may actually prefer to pay a higher rate, but to lock in your financing uh, for several years in advance. So if that's the case, then how should we expect the uh, relation between a longer term rate, let's say the two-year rate that we see here, and the one-year rate and the expected rate a year from now to be. Well, really, we can capture this idea that investors are risk averse by adding a liquidity premium to the long-term rate. In other words, we can still say that the two-year rate is essentially what we call a geometric average of the one-year rate and the expected rate a year from now, because remember, we should achieve the same outcome if we compound the two-year rate for two periods, or if we compound the one-year rate with the expected rate a year from now. So all we've really done is moved over that exponent of two over to the other side, but this mathematically is defined as a geometric average. But now we tack onto that a liquidity premium. So let's look at an example of what that would actually do. Uh, first of all, what uh, shape that would actually induce in our term structure now. And furthermore, how that would affect the relation between the forward rate and the expected future rate. Remember, I'm doing the expectations hypothesis. Those two are the same. Uh, what would they be like if we introduce a liquidity premium? Well, let's see. So let's look at the differences that having a liquidity premium introduces relative to expectations hypothesis. We've got our initial setup for the expectations hypothesis, a short-term yield 
in the spot rate for one year of 2%. The expected yield for a one year rate a year from now, 4%. Uh, let's leave the liquidity premium at zero for now and remind ourselves what the two-year yield should be according to the expectations hypothesis. Remember, it's just one plus the spot one-year yield times one plus the expected one-year yield a year from now. to the power of one half minus one, or three percent. Now that's expectations hypothesis world. What if we introduce a liquidity premium? Then our expression for the two year yield would be that plus whatever the liquidity premium is and let's make this half of 1% or 0 0.005. Now that pushes up our two-year spot yield to 3.5%, remember, because now we're allowing for investors to be risk-averse. The idea is that they are more worried about locking up their money for a longer period of time, or alternatively, borrowers are actually willing to pay Half a basis, uh, half a percent more, uh, to get money for a longer period of time. So, what does this mean for the shape of the term structure? Well, now we actually see that the longer term rate is greater than ge the geometric average of the two short term rates. Remember, the geometric average would just be this bit here. So then, that would be. 3% and now we're adding a premium on top of that. So that will lead to the upward sloping term structure that we observe in the real world, uh, therefore justifying the likely existence of a liquidity premium. Um, now could we actually get still a downward sloping yield curve even with a liquidity premium? Um, sure we could, because if we have a expected future short-term rate that's low enough, then that can produce a long-term rate that is still lower. So let's reduce our expectation of the yield a year from now from 4% to let's say just 1%. Now that means that the term structure is actually going to be flat, right? The yield for a two-month, sorry, a two-year bond is going to be 2% just as the yield for a one-year bond um, but if we reduce it even further, then we can see that we actually can have a downward sloping yield curve where the yield to maturity on a longer maturity bond is actually less than that on a short maturity bond. Now let's reset this back to what we initially had and think about the relation with the forward rate. Remember, under expectations hypothesis, the expected short-term rate a year from now was the same thing as the forward rate. Is it still with the liquidity premium? Well, the formula for the forward rate actually hasn't changed, so we can compute the forward rate for one year a year from now. Remember, that's going to be 1 plus the longer term rate at the end of the period for which we're computing the forward rate to the number of periods equal to the maturity of that bond. So in this case, this is a two-year bond. This would be to the second. And we're going to divide that according to our formula for the forward rate by one plus the yield on a bond with a maturity one less than that, so that would be the one-year bond, to the actual maturity of that in years, this would be to the first, and we're going to subtract one from the whole thing, and our answer is 5%. So in this case, the forward rate is actually different from the expected rate a year from now. So let's generally look at the relation between 
uh, the liquidity premium and expectations of future rates. We can actually see that this theory is quite general and can explain or allow for uh, different shapes of the term structure. So for example, let's consider the plot in the upper left. We have an upward sloping term structure. Uh, and this is driven in part by expectations of higher short-term rates. And on top of that, also a positive liquidity premium. Now, the liquidity premium is always going to be positive. Uh, you wouldn't really expect risk-averse investors to actually uh, demand more compensation to invest in the short term than the long term. So this part's going to be positive. But let's see what happens if the expectation of future rates actually varies. So for example, over here in the top right, we still have the same upward sloping term structure, but indeed now it's driven by completely different underlying dynamics. We have a negative expected future rate. So in other words, uh, the future rate ex is expected to be lower, but the term structure is still sloping upward because the investors are demanding a huge risk premium for longer term borrowing in this example. Now, why this might be, uh, this example doesn't really get into, uh, but there could be a number of macroeconomic reasons why investors would become much more risk averse. And remember, really, the degree of risk aversion uh, is what drives the magnitude of this liquidity premium. So in fact, it can become so large that it would overpower a negative expectation or expectation of lower future interest rates. Now, over here in the bottom left, we can see a negative sloping term structure of interest rates. And this would be driven by very low expectations of future interest rates. Uh, so low, in fact, that even a positive liquidity premium can't offset them fully. Therefore, future rates are expected to be lower than current rates leading to a negative slope. Uh, but remember, the liquidity premium is always going to be positive. And finally, uh, this is sort of what we would expect or we would observe under expectations hypothesis, a flat yield curve uh, can still come about. Really what it uh, would imply is that the liquidity premium is exactly as big as the expectation of lower future returns. So those two offset each other perfectly. Now, the third theory of the term structure of interest rates um, looks at sort of investor preferences for other reasons besides risk aversion. And one reason that we may need an additional theory here is because we still haven't explained what might be driving that hump shape that we saw in the Financial Times uh, plot of yields in about 2019. So segmented markets essentially uh, suggest that some investors prefer to trade some bonds, others prefer to trade other bonds, and they don't necessarily overlap. Um, essentially what this then means is that there's two segmented markets, or perhaps more, but let's uh, imagine just two for now. Let's say that there is a market for short-term bonds and a market for long-term bonds. And in the short-term market, there's short-term investors. Uh, they have a certain demand for short-term bonds. There's a certain supply uh, of, sh of short-term bonds. And that sets the equilibrium rate for the short-term market. And there's a separate market clearing process that sets the equilibrium rate for the long-term market. And that may actually mean, or that may actually help explain uh, why a 30-year rate can actually be lower than a 20-year rate. So in other words, we could have a, a yield curve that sort of looks like this. So we've got our 20-year rate somewhere around here. And we have a short term, let's say a three month rate 
over here. And now here we have our longest, usually there aren't too many rates longer than a 30 year rate. But if each of these is determined as its own separate sort of submarket, there's some people who want to trade three month bonds, some people who want to trade 20 year bonds, some who want to trade 30 year bonds. Well, it could be that for, for whatever reason, the market clearing rate at the 30 year horizon is actually lower than at the 20 year.